I have to say that I'm very excited to talk to you guys about my top reads for the year of 2021. Unlike my worst reads of the year where that video just reminded me of how enraged and anger filled I can be when I read terrible books. This is going to be a video where I talk about books that brought me joy, made me cry, made me laugh, made me heartbroken, made me whole. Despite what was happening in the world, I had such an amazing reading experience <laughs> in the year of 2021. And a lot of the books that I'm going to talk about in today's video are not just top reads of 2021. They have joined the Hall of Fame for some of my favorite books ever. So I have about 13 books. I was trying to get the list down to 10, but it just wasn't really working. I wanted to talk about at least three to four more books. And I thought about taking the list up to 15 because I read 160 books in the year of 2021. And if I subtract the 10 that I hated, that's still 150 books. And so it would have been easy to pick 15, but I wanted to just keep this video true to all of the books that like I can run off the top of my head without thinking about it that I loved in the year of 2021 and I got 13. First up we have In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I, I don't have the book in front of me but I believe that that is the author's name. This is a raw and transparent memoir about Carmen and her experience in this same-sex domestic violence and domestic abusive relationship. I thought that this book was just so like emotionally provoking. I'm not someone who always talks about memoirs and autobiographies on my channel, but this one definitely deserves its place on the top of the year for me. There's so many devices that Carmen used that was just perfectly done to convey the story to the reader. The book covers so many things from like just bisexual phobia and public scrutiny and how people view you and just having unhealthy relationships with sex, unhealthy relationships with people, um, and they're like in terms of her attraction to them and differentiating the difference between a sexual attraction and a platonic attraction to just be happy to have someone by your side. She's so raw and open about all the experiences that she's had in her life, but it's more than just you reading about these things that just have happened to her. She takes you through so so many different metaphors for what the dream house is and so the book is divided up into like these sub chapters and like it literally starts with dream house as a prologue dream house as a metaphor dream house as not a metaphor dream house as falling in love for the first time like you get to just walk through this dream house and really put yourself in the state of mind of our main character and just understanding what's happening to her and even beyond that there are so many chapters in this book where it's told through the second person narrative and I don't always love second person POVs but the story of how she started to like find herself attracted to this person, their exploration into like a polyamorous relationship, their first time using a strap on, their first time uh, meeting parents, their, like their first time doing everything is told through a second person narrative. So it feels like you're doing this. You're falling in love for the first time. You're exploring your sexuality for the first time. You're in a throuple house shopping for the first time. And when the abuse starts to come in, it feels like it's literally happening to you. And it just really puts you in the freaking story. I love when authors take something like this, like an autobiography or a memoir, and like use different devices to really convey the story that they're trying to tell. There's so many books that I have read that are sapphic and have a female-female romance or like relationship aspect to the book, but it doesn't ever really dive into like the nuances and how diverse a relationship can be between two women. She even talks about exploring um, being attracted to films and stems and studs. This one gives you a true understanding, a true image, a true experience of a real sapphic relationship and how common it is for you to experience domestic abuse between women and women. Even the polyamorous aspect and them discovering like, okay, I want to be with you, but I also want to be with her and like she's okay with it and you're okay with it and this just feels right like there's so many aspects um of just queer diversity that you will be able to like put yourself in when you read this book I highly recommend the audiobook it's only five hours long it is narrated by the author herself I cannot recommend this book enough for a memoir it is top tier I'm gonna always be thinking about it it's gonna always be a recommendation for people to just learn about queerness bisexuality women with women relationships sex with women um domestic abuse like everything was just covered in this book and it is literal perfection next set of books on this list I read at the beginning of this year literally in January 
January and I read them um, when I was in a slumpy period. I was not in the best of moods and I was just trying to feel connected to something and just feel something when I was reading them and these books definitely did that for me. These books are so freaking good but even beyond that I love them for the quality that they are and the story that she tells in these books but also the experience that I had reading them. They will always be precious to me because of uh, the state of mind I was in the beginning of this year when I read it and that is going to be Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. These books are like everything to me again a lot of the books i'm going to mention in this video they make my heart flutter and jump and these are like in the hall of fame i read strange the dreamer and fell in love with it music nightmares is like a perfect freaking book and these are different from strange the dreamer and that really talks about just the range that lady taylor can do with her writing uh in these books if you don't know what they're about we're following this character by the name of Carew. Carew is someone who like teeters on the uh borderline between our world and a fantasy world that she knows nothing about. She was raised by these creatures that only ever let her get as close to like the other world as a door. Imagine stepping into a room where there's a door on one side and door on the other and the door on the other side would take you into the fantasy world. The closest she's ever gotten to her fantasy world is like this in-between space and the people who are raising her will not answer any questions about it. They won't tell her anything. She doesn't know her parents. She doesn't know how she was raised. She just knows that like there's certain aspects of her life that she cannot share with her best friend and her closest friend because they don't understand that there are magical portals in the world and different creatures exist and Karu is is someone who has so many secrets within herself that she does not know so you get to follow her in these books as she unlocks them and there is a romance in this book one of my favorite characters ever and that is Akiva. Akiva is this angel who is very upset very angry about this war that's been happening uh, between angels and a different species and he is out for revenge and then one day he just kind of crosses Karu and they meet at like the wrong time and he literally tries to murder her and she's very much just like what is your problem I've never met you before in my life what's your beef with me so you get to follow this beautiful tragic and like poetic story between this war with different species and them being on the opposite side of one another and just trying to work through the emotions that they have with Karu feeling like she lost out on the family that she always loved and wanted and then Akiva being torn between letting his grief of the past go and getting what he deems to be much deserved revenge. I think that these books are top tier YA and if you're looking for a trilogy to just jump into and consume and eat up, I highly recommend these. Now, I do not recommend the audiobooks. The audiobooks for this, like, competes with like the number one spot for the worst audiobooks I've ever heard. Throughout this year I know a couple of people who have read the series and everyone who has listened to it solely on audio did not enjoy it and the audiobooks are just really really bad. Um, I know Erin uh, read book one by herself and she thought book one was really good. I think she might have even given it three stars. She really enjoyed it and then for book two she tried to listen to audio and she even said that like it was awful. The audiobooks for these I'm sorry to say are just not good. I would recommend going with Strange to Dream or Musa Nightmares which is also by Lainey Taylor. Those audiobooks are like chef's kiss. I love Steve West. I can recommend those but definitely not for these. I just wanted to put that out before anyone wastes an audible credit because I don't think that you would enjoy this book on audio like because they're just not good. The next book on this list is like so perfect in terms of like the plot and the world and the setup and the characters. This is a book that I consumed in one day from like I want to say maybe early in the morning I just sat on my couch and read this the entire day I ate it up. I could not put it down and that is going to be The Ladies of the Secret Circus. I did not expect to love this book as much as I did and it just makes me smile thinking about my experience reading this book. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe this. In this book, we have this character by the name of Laura. And Laura is supposed to get married one day. And on the day of her wedding, her betrothed actually disappears from this town. And she discovers that his disappearance is linked to three other disappearances that have happened on the same day, in the same spot, in the same town, uh, 30 years apart. So every 30 years on this day, 
someone goes missing from this spot. And her mother is someone who keeps a lot of secrets that she thinks she's doing uh, for the safety of her daughter. They have magic but her mother makes her hide it so there is like a sense of magical realism to this book. It's very like dark and like grim whimsical which I didn't even know was a thing until I read this book. If you've ever read The Night Circus you know The Night Circus has this like very dark aspect to the circus. This is extremely similar but I would wager to say that it is even more dark. In the midst of dealing with this missing fiance uh, she starts to dig more into the past of her family and there's just a lot of plot holes that is happening in this family tree and her mother is not giving her the most straightforward answer and she discovers that her grandmother used to be the heir to this secret circus. It's also called like a dark or like demonic circus. It's literally a circus from hell and the people that participate in the circus they do extremely dangerous things. It's very bloody and gory and they do it for the entertainment of people but the circus is actually run by an actual demon. I can't think of the demon's name in this book um, but he is called Lucifer's favorite and so as a demon he is over certain souls to torture in hell and one of the ways that he chooses to pass time is to make the people who are serving time in hell participate in this circus uh, mostly for amusement and so I don't know if this is actually like a good purgatory or not. I don't know if you would rather actually like be in hell or perform these deathly tricks. The people who are forced to participate in this circus are already dead so they can't die again but it's still very sinister uh, the things that occur in this circus and that they're forced to do for the entertainment of the people. If you're looking to jump into like whimsical and fantastical books because I know that I talk about them a lot on my channel I would highly recommend this one because it starts in Virginia and as you descend into like the whimsical aspect it is so easy for you to understand. I don't feel like the writing escapes you. I feel like everything is perfectly explained and by the time the book actually shifts to this entire like dark grim whimsical world you have been along with Laura for the whole time and you understand everything that's happening. This book was just such a fun time and I didn't know that a circus from hell run by a demon killing people over and over who are already dead for his amusement was like what I was missing from my reading life. But again if you've been following my channel you know the type of books that I like. That sounds perfect like does that not sound like a Monet type of book? The next book we have is going to be All of Us Villains. This was definitely one of my favorite YA books for the year. I cannot wait for the conclusion to this duology next year. If you do not know what All of Us Villains is about, we are following seven prominent families as they compete in this very deadly blood trials for control over high magic and all of our characters are more so villainous. They're not exactly good people and one of the things that like I really enjoyed about this book is that our characters are not all evil like the, you don't go into the book like okay these are extremely evil people and they're always gonna make bad decisions so like you know exactly what's gonna happen. I feel like Amanda and Christine did a, such a good job of really flushing out these characters and like showing that they do have a heart and they can make good decisions but will they? Even with our characters being brutal and sinister you still don't know like you're on the edge of your seat when you're reading this like is this the moment where they're gonna like finally do the right thing because you really believe that like they're possible of doing the right thing and then just when you're like confident that they're gonna make the right choice sometimes they do sometimes they don't. This is definitely a more um, brutal and gory YA book that I've read in a long time and I'm so excited that I was able to read it this year. Next book is going to be a non-fiction and I believe that I've talked about this book quite a few times on my channel and that is going to be Cultish by Amanda Fontel. This is definitely one of my more favorite non-fictions. I'll probably do a video soon on all of the non-fictions that I just ate up and this one was just so fun because Amanda goes through this explanation of how language is sometimes used and manipulated to bring about cultish uh, features and really just diving into how people will swear that they would never be caught up in a cult and just showing the reader how easy it is. I love how she discusses in the past uh, like early 1900s in America the term cult was not derogative or like negative. The term cult literally meant a religious sect or like a different denomination of a certain religion and how the word cult became something else through the culmination of all these different peaks in our society where we started to think about cults as like this bad things and how some things today are cultish like 
people who are ride or die for Starbucks or Taylor Swift fans or Beyonce's Beehive, CrossFit, uh, Lululemon. When you're in a cult, there is a certain type of lingo and language that you use to differentiate people that are actually within the cool kids and how each different group has this language and like overall colloquialism that they use. And it may be something that you've been using on a daily basis and not realizing and not noticing it. And this book was just so fun and enlightening. And I feel like she did such a good job of taking something that could be dissected in terms of like really a thesis and making it digestible. It is a perfect book for someone who doesn't always read nonfiction. I would highly recommend the audiobook for this because it is just so understandable and she gives you everything in bite-sized pieces. I do want to mention that like she's not talking about cults in a negative way and your takeaway from this book shouldn't be oh my god I've been a part of the Starbucks cult and I need to jump out. It's very much just understanding and being aware of the things that you partake in. Just being more aware of the things that cults provide and why someone might want to be in a cult because there is a sense of like inclusivity and like a community and like people who understand you and get you and like you're never really alone when you're in such a tight-knit community and sometimes even that can be cultish. The next book was definitely my favorite thriller of the year. It is a psychological thriller and it is a debut and I will forever buy anything this author puts out because to go this hard for a debut, unheard of. She didn't need to come for a next like that and that is going to be The Push by Ashley Audrain or Audrain. I think her name, I think her last name is Audrain. I'm sorry if I said that wrong but this book will have you like questioning everything you think you know about motherhood, about men and husbands and fathers and daughters and like the relationship that you should have with your kids or like expect to have with your kids. This book covers so much in like less than 300 pages. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is the perfect book to jump into for a psychological thriller and like the way the book ends I was just like you cannot be serious. Like that's not the last page. Like Oh my gosh, this book was so freaking good. We are following this character. What is her name? Bright? Blythe. We are following this character by the name of Blythe and you get excerpts from Blythe's mother and grandmother and you discover along the way that the grandmother was very troubled and she had a lot of things going on with her. Some of it was just being uh, very spiteful um, and some of it was just trauma and PTSD that she was going on in her life and how that really shaped how she treated her daughter and you see how Blythe's mother was raised by her grandmother and then how she treated her daughter so you start to see this generational effect on three one two three four on like four generations on how like this started here and now you're exhibiting stuff with this person and now this person is exhibiting stuff here and then when you get to Blythe there's this huge dichotomy between like Blythe what what you're doing and this relationship that you have with your daughter Violet I don't understand it like is it because Blythe doesn't know how to be a good mom because she was messed up by her mom who was messed up by her grandmother or is this really a demon child because Blythe is really trying and I don't know if it's you or if it's her but we got to figure this out it was such a scooby-doo uh mystery for me because I was just like she may be a troubled child but is that your fault I don't know because like she came out like that right it makes you question the things that you pass on to your daughters and like I said you spend most of this book trying to understand if this relationship between Blythe and her daughter isn't working out because of just this generational curse or if maybe after generations of terrible mothers we now just have a terrible child so many things happen in this book. I don't recommend reading the synopsis. Literally just go off of what I told you. You're going to follow Blythe over a time period and she's going to walk you through this narrative of this relationship between her and her daughter who don't really get along. They're very troubled and you're just basically trying to discover uh, what's happening. Now besides that, Ashley covers so many things from Blythe being in college and being in love and thinking about possibly having children one day and then actively trying to have children one day and like what pregnancy was like to her body and just watching her her skin stretch and stretch marks come across her watching her boobs de deflate she talks about breastfeeding like this is a book that will put you in a speculative situation on what it's like to be a mother and it was just done so perfectly well I do not think that you have to be a mother or ever want kids and matter of fact if you don't ever want kids this is birth control in a book 
if you're looking for a good psychological thriller that you're just going to eat up, definitely this one. If you're in a book club or you're doing a buddy read, this is a book that will bring about so much conversation because the way that the book ends, you're just like, I, I knew it. I fucking knew it. But like the book is over. So like you get no groundwork to lay down your argument to say like I was right or I was wrong or like we didn't even get no answers over this. And so I feel like when you finish this book, you're going to be so unsettled that you're going to have to discuss this with someone. So if you have a friend who reads books, I highly recommend that you guys read this as a buddy read because when this book ends, you're not going to be like the book is going to be over it, but you're not going to be over it. You're going to want to talk. And I recommend that you read this with somebody. Next book is a book that stole my heart immediately. And that is going to be The Inheritance of Orcadia Divina. I cannot say how much like room this book has in my heart. It is magical realism perfection. There's so much representation in here. And I just cannot recommend this one enough. We are following this family of Orcadia Divina who is this matriarch and grandmother and she is someone who doesn't share a lot about her past. She doesn't share a lot about her history and she's just a very secretive person. <laughs> trying to get information out of her about her life is equivalent to trying to crack a cold at a bank and that may be why I loved her because I am someone who is kind of the same way. I don't always share information about myself and the more questions that you ask me the less I'm willing to answer and Orcadia is very much the same way. Like when they ask a question she's very much just like touch your nose you don't need to know that what, what are you asking me that for i love this freaking grandmother but in this book she writes a letter to all of her descendants kids and grandkids and all of that telling them to come back to their family home because she is passing away and they need to get their inheritance and they are just fed up with orchidea they feel like she's such a drama queen she's so dramatic like who writes out letters saying come get an inheritance because i'm dying and they go anyway because like it's family but everyone's just coming like unreluctantly it's like pulling teeth like okay I, don't, I can't believe we have to deal with this right now and one of the things that Orcadia says is like hey by the way I never told you guys this but like someone was hunting me and they're out to get me and I have been protecting our family house and all of you by extension through our family magic and now that I'm dying I can't do that no more so like peace out good luck stay alive I may or may not see you on the other side and her descendants are just like family magic hello we don't have no family magic too if he's chasing you, what that got to do with us? Like if you're in the ground, what, what do we have to do with the person who's hunting you? And she literally just dips out. So her descendants are left to like figure that out. They have this inheritance that they don't know what means. They don't know who's after them. They don't know if it's a man or a woman. They don't know how to get this person off of their back. They don't know anything about their grandmother and they need to figure this stuff out in order to break this curse and stop this person from like haunting them. Every single person that meets Orcadia or ever met Orcadia has such a different uh, take on her and the kind of person that she was. And so you get bits and pieces of just how amazing and well versed and just well lived Orcadia was. And it's just like your grandmother was just such an interesting and strong and amazing person and I understand you guys are like annoyed but like back up off her okay I felt like she was my grandma like if I was in this family I would be like y'all y'all not gonna talk to uh granny like that y'all gonna have to back up y'all have to back up but I do understand the family's frustration in this book this book is so consumable and if you just let this book sweep you away and take you away I have no doubt that you're gonna have such a good time okay now everybody has their fantasy romance series that's like their brand there's people who are diehard Akatar fans and there are people who absolutely hate it there are people who are diehard Crave fans and there's people and I'm talking about me I'm people who absolutely hate Crave there's people who who love from blood and ash and there's people who hate it i did not enjoy from blood and ash but uh this series right here <laughs> guild glint and most of all my favorite at the moment gleam this is my fantasy romance okay i do have one more that i enjoyed this year and that is a fate of wrath and flame but listen orin orin is my favorite pitiful bitch She's so sad and pitiful and just, just ugh, melancholy all throughout this book. I ate it up though. It's, it's, it's for me. Like it's the fantasy. Everybody had their pick and I was out here starving until Raven Kennedy. This is where I eat up 
my fantasy romance and I make no apologies for that. So I do feel like the synopsis for these books are very very vague so I'm going to try to give a little more information without spoiling it completely. Orin is a girl who is entirely gold from head to toe and she is the favorite concubine or saddle for this king Midas who is known for everything he touches turning to gold and he prizes her like she's his most prized possession and he's very obsessive over her and Orin has lived within this cage physically she's been in a physical cage a gilded gold cage for 10 years but she's also been in a mental and emotional cage through King Midas and she meets this character throughout the series who starts to make her question if Midas deserves this loyalty that she's given to him if he deserves the secrets that she harbors and keeps for him in these three books you have Orin our sad pitiful character who is stuck between King Midas and like her love for him and whether or not he is the person that she sees he can be and the person she views him as in real life. And then also this second love interest that they also have a very complicated relationship. I'm going to forewarn you that you do not meet the love interest in book one at all. Um, and when you do meet him, it is not an Akatar situation where as soon as you see Resan, Tamlin no longer matters. Orin's relationship with Midas and her love interest is pivotal to the entire series for the three books that we've read so far. We do follow other POVs sometimes, but like, it's just all sadness. Like, girl, get it together. But I'm hooked. I'm addicted. So yeah. So we're getting down to my last five uh, top reads of the year. This next book made me cry in under an hour. I kid you not. This book is 96 pages. The audiobook is one hour and like 19 minutes and I was crying like a newborn baby. I cannot believe that this man broke me down for parts in 96 pages. This is An Every Morning The Way Home Gets Longer and Longer by Frederick Bachman. This is a very short but heart wrenching novella about this grandfather. This grandfather really loves his grandson Noah. Loves him so much that he calls him Noah Noah because he wants to say it twice and it just means a lot to him. It's so fucking cute. Uh, but the grandfather in this book has amnesia and he's trying to figure out how to explain to Noah that he's going to be here physically but he's not going to be able to stay here and just figuring out how to say goodbye how to get goodbye right not wanting to leave being terrified to leave wanting to join his wife who has already passed and just <sighs> if you are looking for just such a wholesome read like if not it's sad of course but it is so like heartfelt because like you feel the love that this grandfather has between himself and with Noah and like in 96 pages we get an entire story because like for example the grandfather used to work a lot and so for his son he was never really able to be around and he messed up a lot of things in his own son's life that he has been trying actively to get right for his grandson. So he was essentially a better grandfather than he was father. And while he's been a grandfather and doing it right, his time is winding down. And I cannot believe that I paid $20 for this little book, but baby, read it. Get the audiobook, listen to it. It's one hour of your life. You will not regret it. So the next book I read earlier this year in like May, April, maybe March or April, and it has been with me since I need to do a reread. That is going to be Fires of Vengeance. Now let me give you a full disclosure. If you don't know what Fires of Vengeance is, it is the sequel to Rage of Dragons. Not that Rage of Dragons is bad. I definitely really enjoyed this book. But the fact that I personally sprayed my edges for this one and like made my own custom edition just lets you know that like this book was it for me. I had such a fun time reading this book. I actually got to discuss it on World Hoppers and I will try to find that video and link it below. This series is actually called The Burning and I believe that it's supposed to be a quartet right now and so we're waiting on book three to come out. We're following this character by the name of Tao. Tao is young and hot-headed and empty-headed and he, he he's a dummy. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> he's definitely a dummy. Um, Tao is 
Tao lives in this uh, very steep caste society and he is considered a part of the lower caste and he always has to respect his betters, let his betters get the upper hand over him. Not only are they above him in terms of just classism, they are physically stronger. Like their their DNA, their blood, their buildup is just generally uh, superior to his. Something happens in the beginning of book one and Tao actually loses his father. And he loses his father to people who are higher than him in the caste system. And Tao basically says, I don't give a damn that you are physically stronger than me. Every single one of y'all who played a part in my father's death, I'm going to get revenge. And by golly, he is dedicated to his cause. I'm not gonna say I don't like Tao. He's just not smart. Um, he's a character that will make you angry when you're reading it because he swears revenge very often and he will have a plan in his head. He's like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And yeah, this is how it's gonna go. And then he sees the person on his hit list, on his burn list, and he immediately loses all thought. His head goes completely empty. Any plan that we spent 50 to 100 pages trying to figure out, he X names all that shit and goes right for blood. And a lot of times, as you can imagine, he is not successful. So when I was reading this book, I was just like, please, please, please give me a character that like has a little bit of a brain cell. Just, just sprout the seed, Lord, please give him a little bit of a brain cell. Cause Tao, Tao is a vast landscape vast landscape not a plant in sight coming in in the third spot you guys should not be shocked at all that is going to be jade legacy this was such an epic ending that like my, my top three reads because we're down to my top three now i believe uh my top three the endings of these books <sighs> forever will reign jade legacy was everything that i needed it to be and so much more there's so many moments in this book that like live rent free in my head I could not get them out like I, re I literally vividly remember uh, I got the arc of this book earlier this year and I ate it up in like four or five days I could not put it down I was like eating reading I couldn't go to sleep because I was reading <laughs> and I just devoured this book and there was just so many moments where like I could have did a spit take like my eyes were bulging out of my head because I was like that did not just happen like <sighs> If you were thinking about picking up the Greenbone Saga, let this be a sign. If you've been watching a lot of best books of the year from fantasy readers, I'm gonna bet that you've seen this book 10 times already and like pick up the heat, like read the room. We all love it and it must be for a reason, like read it. For the next series, I read these uh, as soon as it got really cold outside, right around Christmas where it started snowing and I read them by my fireplace and it was such a fun time and like I ate them up back to back and then when I got to the finale, this finale took me on an emotional roller coaster. I tried to get enough the book four times, I was crying, I threw the book, I ranted to my friends, I ranted to my husband, I called my mama. This book hurt me so much, I called my mama because I have never been swept across the floor like I was with the finale of this series and that is going to be the bear and the nightingale series. Uh, it's called the winter night trilogy uh, book one is the bear and the nightingale book two is the girl in the tower and book three the one who wrecked me shattered me to pieces is the winter of the witch this entire trilogy is a coming of age story about this girl named Vasya and it's just about so much. She is in early Russia, like before Russia is even really a country. It's just a set of nomadic states. Um, and Moscow is trying to like become a real city, but they're really just vassal states for the Mongol Empire. And there is this war between pagan and Christianity. And, uh, you know, these different vassal kings wanted to break free of the Mongol Empire. And this was at... Uh, and this was, and this is actually set in a time period where the Mongol Empire was crumbling and like descending into chaos. Now, this audiobook is the worst. Like, it's worse than Daughter of Smoke and Bone. This is the worst audiobook I've ever heard. I do not. Like, if you were gonna try audio, I would just say no. The audiobooks are terrible. I will say that, like, as much as I love them, in book one, which is The Bear and the Nightingale, the writing is so, like, grandiose for almost no reason. So in the beginning, it does feel like an AP literature book to read, but if you can just make it through the books until you get to here, this is 
God, I love these books so much. I feel like I need to do a video on all of my favorite adult fantasy series and just why I love them and diving into depth because I don't think that my channel actually knows my favorite adult fantasy series. I've never really uh, done a sit down video where I list them off. And so I would definitely do that for you guys. But yeah, this, this series, I was not okay. I was not okay. I was so angry. <laughs> now for my number one read of the year, if you did not see these books come in, like, Shame on you. You must not have been watching my content for the last couple of months. Like, it's pitiful if you did not guess that Theft of Swords was going to be my top read of the year. Michael J. Sullivan, I'm going to petition the Lord to let him into heaven for writing these books. I kid you not. Hadrian and Royce will forever reign in my mind, in my heart. Volume 1 is Theft of Swords. Volume 2 is Rise of Empire. And Volume 3 is Heir of Navrin. We start off following these two characters by the name of Hadrian and Royce. And they are hired to steal this sword. And they're just like, cool, because Royce is a mercenary and a thief for hire. And so is Hadrian. He's an expert swordsman. And they just do different jobs for money. They're hired by this noble to go and steal the sword from this person and when they get there the king is actually dead at the spot where they were supposed to steal the sword and the sword was actually used to kill the king and now they have been framed for the murder of the king and Hadrian and Royce discover along the way that they're trying to clear their name that this was not about just killing one king of a small kingdom there is an entire ploy here to take over all of the kingdoms and bring them under a very imperial rule I put those down because they're like heavy as hell. I cannot stress enough how much I love these books. I think they definitely took the top spot for like my favorite adult fantasy series. I feel like they are so digestible. If you were trying to jump into adult fantasy, this is the place to start. I don't know any other adult fantasy book that I can think of that has such an understandable uh, magic system that will introduce you to high magic or like just powerful wizards in total. Um, the political ploys is so digestible as well. In this series, Hadrian and Royce go to every kingdom and every part of this country and you get to really understand what's happening in these countries and like see it firsthand and this is by far the easiest and like best intro to adult fantasy book I think that you're gonna find and I stand by that. I love these books so much like I would fight physical I would throw physical hands over Hadrian and Royce okay and those are all of my top reads from the year of 2021 if you're gonna take any recommendations from this video comment down below which ones you are sold on and why and what you'll be reading and definitely if you read any of them reach out to me because I love these books so much part of the reason why I'm in the book community and I make videos is because I want to talk about really good books and I think that this video is filled with really good books so if you read them write me a message if you've made it to the end of this video leave me the grandpa emoji and i will see you guys next time